Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ken Duberstein, a member of the Brookings Board of Trustees, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's campaign 2012 kickoff event. Five years ago, I was on this very stage as co-chairman of Opportunity 08, a Brookings project that provided information, insights, and ideas during the 2008 presidential campaign. In fact, I've been honored to share this stage on a number of occasions with various luminaries who have gone on to great heights. It seems everyone I appear with at Brookings winds up with a major role in the Obama administration. <laughs> Tom Donilon, Leon Panetta, John Podesta come immediately to mind. So let me begin with a public service announcement. Anyone, anyone wanting a job in the Obama administration, I am your lucky star. Come on up, okay? Now, 2012 is far different from our discussions in 2008, and the campaign itself is far different as well. As we all know, the country is mired in a prolonged economic slump. And even if we've seen a few blades of winter grass, we certainly have not yet seen any robins on the lawn. The right track and wrong track numbers remain overwhelmingly on the wrong track. Unemployment has been over 8% for 35 consecutive months and was over 9% for 28 consecutive months. GDP growth remains tepid at best, not creating enough jobs to reduce the unemployment rate significantly. Consumer confidence remains near historic lows, and housing starts remain in the proverbial ditch. On the Democratic side, as we all know, we have an incumbent president running unopposed. But no, again, but no elected president in the past half century has entered his re-election year underwater in approval until now. Let me point that out. That's Eisenhower, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush. Obama is at best, according to virtually all polls, in the mid-40s. On the Republican side, we have, as of this minute, five candidates. At 11 o'clock, the press is reporting that Rick Perry is going to drop out. But as of this moment, we have five Republican candidates who have somehow made it through 16 debates without ever remembering Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. <laughs> the debates to many have become or resemble a made-for-TV reality show. Some have wondered even in, with tongue-in-cheek whether a Democratic super PAC or the DNC itself has sponsored all of these Republican debates. <laughs> If Mitt Romney is the nominee, and by the way, if you not, have not heard the news, the, it is a report this morning that Iowa is now saying that Rick Santorum prevailed in Iowa by 34 votes. But if Rick, Rick, Mitt Romney is the nominee, he will surely have had a baptism under fire, but it may not have given, given him a rising tide that will lift his boat. The Republicans remain splintered, and to many keen observers, with seemingly less energy and enthusiasm to date behind Mitt Romney than they do for defeating Barack Obama. So in the words of that wonderful Secretary of State, Don Rumsfeld, here are some of the knowns and the unknowns 
as of January 19th. What will the unemployment rate be as reported on the first Friday of October? Will it be a firm downward trajectory or will it be bouncing all around? Will Mitt Romney, assuming he's the nominee, be able to shape the Republican Party or will the party shape Mitt Romney? Will the super PACs totally dominate the campaign and will mo money fundamentally decide the election? Will President Obama run an uplifting campaign of hope and change or will he, as Ruth Marcus recently wrote in the Washington Post, just run on fear and loathing? Will national security take center stage, a la Iran, the Middle East, the European debt crisis, or North Korea, or God forbid, terrorism? Or will this truly be its, it's the economy stupid election, which I think is likely jobs, jobs, jobs? Will the Congress really be the do-nothing target Obama is trying to paint? Or will public opinion force President Obama and the Congress into governing? Which, after all, as my old boss, President Reagan, used to say, is in fact the best politics. Will social issues and Occupy Wall Street and religion play any significant role in the general election campaign? Will this be a size, scope, and role of government election? or will it be a referendum on the incumbent? We will find out in 292 days, which is 292 lifetimes, the answer to many of these questions. But no matter who is elected, that person has to govern. He has to bring people together. The job of president is simply is not, not simply to build consensus in Washington. It is to build consensus in America, and then Washington will follow. Let's hope that the campaign will elevate both sides. So come next January 20th, a president and a Congress can work together to find common ground. As we all know, the stakes are enormous. Kicking the can down the field is not acceptable. We face huge challenges. So over the course of this campaign 2012 project, Brookings will offer background and ideas on the top 12 challenges facing our country. These, in, these include the economy, the Arab awakening, healthcare, energy, and today's topic, the budget deficit. Our project director is Ben Wittes, a senior fellow in the government, Governance Studies Program. Ben is an expert on terrorism and law, as well as being a reformed journalist. Let me turn the program over to Ben to tell you a little bit more about the project, and then let my good friend John Harris of Politico start our discussion. Ben, thank you very much. I'm not sure I've ever been called a reformed journalist before, but <laughs> thanks for that wonderful setup and introduction. So I'm, I'm, as none of you are here to uh, listen to me, I'm going to be very brief. Um, but I did want to talk, uh, just briefly explain a little bit about how the project, the larger project of which today's event is the kickoff event, is going to work and how it was conceptualized over the past um, and how it is sort of a continuation of and a little different from what we did four years ago. Um, so as, as Mr. Duberstein made clear, this is a, a, a sort of a continuation of, of what Brookings did four years ago in, in the Opportunity 08 program. And the, the basic idea now as then um, was to, you know, discuss policy ideas for the next administration situated in the context of the current campaign. Um, the, um, you know, 
we at Brookings, we don't, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Bain Capital and whether it was, you know, job creating or job killing. We're not going to, um, we are going to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, job creation policy. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time, as the campaign sometimes do, you know, talking about whether Sharia is a threat to the United States. We're, we're, we are going to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, U.S. policy in the Muslim world. Um, you're not going to hear at these events a lot of discussion of, um, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich's uh, or Herman Cain's, um, you know, marital infidelities um, or alleged. You're going to hear a lot of talk about, you know, what the next president should or should not do on um, a variety of issues that we deem in our uh, judgments to be important. Um, the Central issues that we're trying to identify, the central concerns that we're trying to identify are, you know, really what should policy look like in the areas that we're concerned about? What, um, what are the critical issues that the candidates are talking about? What are the right answers to them? And what are the right answers to the issues that the candidates aren't talking about? You know, there's a, there's a, tendency always to let the candidate set the terms of, of the debate. Um, but sometimes there are just hugely important issues that, you know, just go by the wayside in campaigns that are much more important in the course of governing than they are in the course of campaigns. And so part of what we feel our role is is to uh, remind people that there are these other issues that aren't actually the subject of much campaign debate, but do occupy or will occupy a lot of attention necessarily in the next administration. What are the real decision points um, of issues in which candidates will issue very sweeping statements, but which the actual room for policy making may be very narrow and very incremental? There are a lot of those issues. You know, we're going to sweep everything off the table, and then you, you get into office, and actually, it's really more of a question of rearranging the silverware in, in, in certain respects. And all of this is sort of bound together by the question of what should the next administration do. And so what, we're, what we tried to do was identify, and this is the area really where this year's project is a little different from Opportunity 08, um, which we identified 12 issues. Um, which we think are, if not, not necessarily the critical issues, but certainly critical issues for the next administration to think about. Um, some are big issues like today's, for example, will be big issues in the campaign itself, and some will not. Some of them are, are issues that we think are important and should be a bigger part of the debate than they're actually likely to be. For each of these issues, we identified one Brookings scholar um, who had done work in that area, sometimes a pair, but, but in, in this case one, who had done important work in that area, and we asked that person to write a main paper kind of discussing the issue in question, the, 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 the record of the, last, the current administration on that, the critique that the opposition party is making of that record, and situating uh, that entire discussion in terms of the question, what should the next administration in the next four years, whether it's a re-elected Obama administration or a Santorum administration or a Gingrich administration, it's a Romney administration, what should it do? What's the sort of right answer for the next administration? Um, and for each of these papers, we then asked two other Brookings scholars with either differing perspectives or sometimes very, a lot of agreement, but just differing areas of expertise who could bring sort of new uh, discussions, and, you know, new information to the discussion. We asked them to write a shorter response paper. Um, and for each of these sets of three papers, we're going to hold an event, this, this being the first, um, to discuss the issue, the role the issue is going to play in the campaign or not play in the campaign and to discuss the realistic policy options that the next administration has in this area. So uh, that's the sort of overview of the project. Now, uh, to, to kick this off, um, we, the, today's event really features a, a really terrific panel um, which has put together three really wonderful papers that I think situate the uh, deficit discussion in a in a wonderful light and, and, and really bring out a lot of, a, a lot of nuance and, and, uh, in it. 
I commend all three papers to you all. Um, and um, to moderate the discussion, um, John Harris, who's the editor-in-chief of the Politico, um, and um, one of the just keenest political observers around and, and who, uh, on a personal note, was an old colleague of mine at the Washington Post, where we are, I guess I'm a reformed journalist, he's merely a reformed postie. Um, and uh, so our advice to the next administration um, comes from Ron Haskins, um, who's the co-director of the Budgeting and National Priorities Project here at Brookings. Um, and we will get responses today from um, sort of areas of agreement and disagreement and sim simply um, related discussions of, of related areas of policy um, from Ron's co-director, uh, Isabel Sawhill, and from Bill Gale, who's the co-director of the Brookings and Urban Institute Tax Policy Center. So with that, I'm going to uh, get off the stage and invite the panel to take it. Great. Well, good morning, uh, and uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, ben, I have to say, I don't uh, consider you a reformed journalist. I consider you a current journalist who's just doing, bringing your work to a new setting. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. I should say I was interested in your, uh, that your roster of all the worthy topics that the series will be covering and all the unworthy topics uh, that you won't be covering. If it, I'd take the opportunity to give a plug. For those of you who are interested in all those unworthy topics, uh, it's www.politico.com. We'll, uh, we'll be all over the things that Ben uh, has decided are unworthy of uh, Brookings. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Politico's uh, uh, delighted to, and I'm delighted to uh, uh, collaborate in this indeed very worthy series and very interesting one. Uh, and I appreciate that. And I'm, Glad to be back in this building where I was at one time uh, many years ago, a fellow and with whom uh, an institution with I've, I've got so many uh, uh, long time uh, associations and very warm associations. Um, I think we can all agree that democracy is just simply too messy. It no longer works. What we really need in this country is a dictator who could impose the right solution. And my candidate to be dictator is Ron Haskins. <laughs> If you were good choice. Uh, <laughs> if you were dictator, how would we solve uh, this? Uh, what many people regard as an insoluble uh, problem uh, of the deficit, uh, and particularly the deficit in the context of our current very weak economy. Uh, what would we do? And in in answering that, I'd like you to also answer the question. Everybody agrees that this issue is hard, but what do they mean? Uh, when they say it's hard. Is it simply politically hard, or if this country were to uh, uh, solve its long-term structural deficit problems, would it actually be really hard? In other words, how much actual suffering, uh, how much pain really needs to take place, or, or is this just basically a politically hard problem that if rational minds, such as your own, could impose a rational solution, everybody would be just fine with some discomfort, but not uh, um, apocalyptic discomfort? Well, I'm not dictator yet. Uh, and um, I've heard that John is a tough moderator, so I'm fully expecting to be cut off <laughs> any moment. Not so let me start with a summary. A pox on both their houses, including the White House. Both parties have been 
horrible in this debate. There have been occasional bright spots and openings that I'll mention in just a minute. But generally, we're really in a bad place on what I think is the nation's most serious problem. This truly threatens the future of the country. And the especially frustrating part about it for me is that everybody knows what the solution is. We're going to raise taxes, we're going to cut spending, and we're going to make some procedural reforms to try to lock in as much as possible the kind of Congress that we have, the solution that we arrive at so that they have to meet it. And I don't think there are any other choices. I mean, there are lots of variability between those three things, but that's the answer. It's hard to get there, but we have to do it. Now, probably the most controversial part of this is increasing taxes. I have lots of former Republican colleagues uh, who have talked to me about this issue in the most delightful possible ways. <laughs> so let me lay out, I'm at Brookings, and I believe in logic and reason and evidence, and so let me say, here's why we have to increase taxes. First of all, every big deal, almost in the history of Washington, has been a compromise. Both sides have to give something. Otherwise, a democratic government doesn't work. So you start off with the, most, the broadest possible argument. The second thing is, we have 10 to 11,000 baby boomers like me retiring every day. Virtually all of them are going to get Social Security and Medicare. We cannot run the government on the same number of amount of revenue that we had in the past. Now, we can cut. We can't keep going the way we're going. We will have to cut spending for sure. But to think that you can do what Romney has done and said, well, 20% is the limit, or some Republicans say 18% is the limit, 18% of GDP, that's not going to work. We need additional revenues. Third, Republicans have had plenty of chances to cut spending. And they not only didn't cut spending, we fought two wars that have cost us on the order of $3 trillion so far. And we increased Medicare, just what we need, more benefits for the elderly. What a wise thing that was. And that costs us $50 billion a year in increasing. So it's kind of hard to think that the Republican Party is going to slash spending when the record would indicate otherwise. Another point is a Republican almost philosophy has been starve the beast. You know, they can't control Democrat spending. They never say their own spending, but that should count too. So they're going to starve the beast. They're going to cut taxes. And when we don't have revenue, we won't spend it. Well, that has been an utter, complete, absolute fiasco because what they taught politicians and the public, I'm afraid, is you can have all kinds of benefits and not pay for them. They've conditioned the country to believe we can get all kinds of stuff and we don't have to pay for it. And finally, we live in a democracy. Poll after poll show the, the public expects progress on this issue. They expect compromise. In many polls, they even a majority would favor or would favor tax increases in a balanced package. They say they want a balanced package. So this is the case for why taxes have to increase. Now, there also have to be spending cuts, to be sure. And the Democrat Party has taken an equally unreasonable position, or many Democrats have, that we're not going to cut uh, either Social Security or Medicare. We are going to cut Medicare for sure, and probably Social Security, but Medicare has got to be cut. Uh, we're now spending 5.6% of our GDP on Medicare, on all health benefits. Medicare is the biggest one, but Medicaid and so forth. By, uh, by 2040, we'll spend 11%, more than twice as much. And by 2080, we'll be spending almost 20% of our GDP. So any trend that can't continue won't. We have to reform these programs, and so the Democrats are also equally at fault. And then I come to the president, who has a big problem in this area, too, I believe. First of all, every annual budget is an opportunity that only one man in the country gets, or one person in the country, to lay out a vision. Secondly, Bold Simpson presented a great opportunity. A majority of people supported a Bold Simpson, which roughly followed the outline that I gave. And more recently, the, the uh, uh, Ryan Wyden proposal, bipartisan, was a huge opening to advance serious Medicare reform, and the president immediately, the same day, turned it down and said that this does not help Medicare. So the part, now, why are the parties having trouble? Very simple. In both cases, what they have to agree to lies at the very heart of what their party stands for. Republicans believe in small government, and they believe in low taxes, and they have to fall backwards on that, and they have been losing this battle anyway. Democrats believe in protecting the programs that they have established, especially Social Security and Medicare, which are clearly great achievements. But they have to compromise on those now. That's why it's so hard. That's a, your answer to your question that's hard. 
The one good thing about the situation is you are going to have a clear choice in the election if the parties are serious about what they're saying. Republicans are going to cut the hell out of spending, and they're not going to increase anybody's taxes. And the president is going to cut some spending. It's not exactly clear what, but he is definitely going to increase the taxes of millionaires and billionaires, which will get us about a fourth of the way that we need to go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was very brief. It wasn't even tempted once to cut you off. Um, there's so much that you said that is so self-evidently sensible that I don't want to spend a lot of time agreeing on what's sensible. Well, I'd like to ask our other two panelists if they heard anything there that they didn't agree with uh, or that they think just reflects a, a, a misplaced emphasis. Uh, Bill, do we want to start with you? Uh, I basically agreed with it, and I would simply put a little different emphasis or, ex or extend what Ron has said in two areas. Uh, first of all, I think that, as Ken Duberstein said, uh, this election is all about jobs, jobs, jobs. And I think it's fine to reduce deficits and debt. We very much need to do that. We need bipartisan compromise. We need everything that Ron just outlined. So I totally agree with that. But I would simply add and, and put three explanation marks uh, with it that we cannot do that in a way that harms this recovery. I think we're all into a mode of thinking about recoveries is that they're short because most recessions in the past have lasted for a couple of years and you think, oh, in six months or a year, the economy will be back to normal. All of the evidence that I've seen suggests that this recovery is going to be very long and very sluggish. It could be five years, uh, even under reasonably optimistic assumptions, before we're back to anything that you might call five full employment. Five, 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 five more years? Five more. Five years. Five more years. So we're basically looking at an eight year recession. We're looking at a Japanese. Eight year sluggish. We're looking at a Japanese type situation. Now, you know, we don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I am. But the point is that in the process of getting our fiscal house in order, we must not uh, undermine the strength of the recovery. What does that mean? That means that we should have policies, including reform of Social Security, including reform of Medicare, including reform of the tax system in a way that raises more revenue, but that doesn't kick in right away. Um, Second thing I would emphasize that Ron didn't mention is the need for shared sacrifice. You asked a minute ago, John, is this going to be painful? Uh, I would say it's going to be very painful. What we need to do is way beyond what anybody imagines. You talk to the public. I've been around the country and talked about this in many different cities with the public. And they think all you need to do is to get a hold of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, cut a few bureaucrats in Washington, free salaries, uh, get rid of fraud in some of our programs, and that will take care of the problem. It's just not true. Seventy percent of all revenues right now go for just three programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, so we need shared sacrifice, and that means that both revenues and spending need to be on the table, as Ron emphasized. But I would then, he's been somewhat critical of the president, and I thought it was interesting when Ken Duberstein said, is this going to be a referendum on Obama, or is this going to be a debate about the role of government and about how we uh, share the pain that we need to have in our future? And I think it has to be and will be in part about the degree of inequality we have in our society now. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street has put this issue on the table. The top 1% now gets 20% of all income in our economy. That's more than double what it was 30 years ago. And yet, when you look at Obama's com likely competitors for the presidency, let's say, let's take Mitt Romney, because he's going to be the likely opponent, what is he proposing? He is proposing deep tax cuts that would increase the deficit something like $2 trillion over the next decade. Furthermore, the top 1% would get 57% of the benefits from those tax, further tax cuts that he's proposing. Uh, that data comes from the group that uh, Bill Gale uh, presides over, the Tax Policy Center. 
And uh, how, is he, how is he reconciling that with the idea of a smaller uh, government in which uh, deficits don't continue to balloon? He's reconciling it by saying, oh, well, we will have a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, and we will reduce spending to 20% of GDP. But he doesn't tell you how. And we will do all that immediately. So in my view, um, the president does uh, deserve some criticism for not, for example, supporting Bowles Simpson. But when you ask compared to what, and you look at what Romney's proposing and what the Republican Party in general is proposing, it's both, uh, what Obama's proposing is both uh, fairer, calls for shared sacrifice, and is much more likely to keep the recovery going. So that's my um, two cents on it. Bill, you want to weigh in here? Uh, sure, thanks. The danger of writing uh, a 1,000-word paper and then going third is that uh, <laughs> Bill and Ron have uh, collectively said almost everything that uh, is, is in the thing that I wrote. So let me make a few comments. Uh, um, I want to offer a friendly, not a disagreement, but a friendly amendment to what Ron said. Uh, Ron described the Republicans as the party of small government and low taxes, and the Democrats as a party of big government and high taxes. I, I would amend that to say both parties are parties of big government and low taxes. The Republicans emphasized the low taxes, but when they were in power, they spent, spent, spent. Uh, the Democrats emphasized the high spending. The, the, you know, they, rightly, they, they proudly stand behind Social Security and Medicare, uh, but they haven't stepped to the plate to offer the, the tax revenues that, that would uh, pay for that. So I think the underlying issue, I would love it if the parties had a, a kind of orderly, rational, civilized debate about low taxes, small government versus high taxes, big government, or really medium taxes, medium-sized government. But neither party is having that debate. They both are, are big government, low taxes. And that's, that's how we end up in the situation that we're in. Um, as to whether it's going to be painful or not, Yes, it is going to be painful. These are, the numbers here are huge. The fiscal gaps we face in the country are on the order of six or seven percent of output. Uh, that means spending needs to go down and taxes need to go up by a combined six or seven percent of output. That's about a trillion dollars a year in today's economy. And if you, so for example, the stimulus package, which was enormous by historical standards, was about $800 billion, and it was crafted over a couple of years, and it was giving money away to people. It was raising spending and lowering taxes. What we need to do is a trillion dollars per year taking money from people, either cutting spending or raising taxes. So that's the order of the problem. There's no way we can get from here to there without imposing serious sacrifice on uh, people, and that's where the shared sacrifice comes in because uh, if you only do spending cuts, for example, you can't get at the top one or the top five percent of the population because they simply don't get that much in Medicare or Social Security and, and definitely not in uh, uh, Medicaid. So if you want shared sacrifice, you need to have tax increases uh, as part of the package uh, because, it's, it's, again, it's the only way to get at um, a high-income household. The other thing you need um, is to expand the tax debate beyond simply the income tax, which is where it's focused so far. Uh, and this is a peculiarly American thing. Um, every other industrialized country has a value-added tax. Uh, many countries have substantial energy taxes and gas taxes that are on the order of five to ten times the size of the tax in the U.S. Some countries have carbon taxes. Uh, this is where the solution is going to lie on the tax side. You, you can generate uh, a little more uh, revenue out of the income tax through reducing tax expenditures, et cetera. Uh, but we're going to need to consider other tax instruments. And the value-added tax in particular is where the money is. Uh, it raises, uh, in many countries, more money than the income tax. And eventually, we're going to have to look at that. Uh, and we need, uh, for energy reasons as well as uh, fiscal policy reasons, to uh, uh, tax, tax the consumption of non-renewable energy. So let me stop there. Yeah, uh, good. I should say uh, we're going to talk up here and get a discussion going. 
uh, at the, the top of this, but uh, the idea is that we get a robust conversation going for the whole, with the whole room. So please be uh, thinking of questions, uh, and I will, at the appropriate time, uh, be recognizing uh, people for those. I've got a question that I really would like to hear everybody on uh, briefly. Uh, there are two views of deficit, of the deficit problem, and the politics that frame the deficit problem. One is that this debate is fundamentally distorted by cynicism. And what I mean by that is that everybody knows what to do. Uh, everybody knows they should do it. But the political incentives that exist in Washington toward polarization, uh, toward taking the easy political shot when somebody uh, proposes something difficult, distort the debate and make progress impossible, and that under this scenario, if everybody would cut the BS, head out to Andrews Air Force Base for a week or whatever it takes to get, uh, get, the, get it done, as, they, as George H.W. Uh, Bush did in 1990, that we could uh, come up with a rational solution uh, by basically penetrating through the cynicism. There is another view that says this problem is difficult, not for cynical reasons, but for principled reasons. That is, Republicans and Democrats have fundamentally different uh, views about the role of government and how it should be, what, si what size it should be, and how it should be funded. This is not a cynical disagreement, but a principled one. And what's needed is not a trip to Andrews Air Force Base, but an election where you have it out and the country decides who's right and who's wrong, and the winner can govern around those premises. So I would like you guys to discuss this. Is this problem uh, an authentic disagreement that a democracy should have, or is it a symptom of political dysfunction uh, that uh, basically is uh, Washington is a petri dish uh, for that, uh, that virus? Well, I, it, it's, it's both. Uh, there's a certain part of cynicism, but this is a really serious difference between the parties and, but, and, and in the country. The problem is it has been obscured by the fact, and I think we're talking about human nature here, that people think that they can have something for nothing. This is America, the home, the free, the land of the brave. You know, we don't have to pay for everything. We'll let foreigners, the Chinese can pay for our Medicare and so forth. And it's worked just fine. And we have, I've been up on this stage on several occasions in the last year and had people whose IQ is far superior to mine and know a lot about government say, that's going to take care of it. Don't worry. You focused way too much on the deficit. Paul Krugman would be an example. Uh, so I think there is a very substantive difference between the parties here. But here, I think, is the most fundamental problem. The most fundamental problem is that American people are undisciplined. This is a fault of the American people. They should not elect folks who think, who tell them you can have something for nothing. That, that's the basic problem. But the other problem is that the parties really have to overcome what they stand for the most. I mean, think, Republicans for 20 years now, even more, have stood for low taxes. And indeed, they sign pieces of paper that say, we'll never increase a tax. And then they love Ronald Reagan, who increased taxes over 20 times. So there's a hypocrisy also on both sides. Democrats are the same way about Social Security and Medicare. So what we need are politicians. If we could have an election like you just suggested, good. Well, we're having an election right now. What's going to happen? I'll bet you a nickel. No, I'll bet you a penny. Mm -hmm. uh, not $10,000. You, You're not as well off as Mitt Romney. The biggest chance for change is that Republicans could take the Senate. They'll probably hold the House and... and Obama will retain the presidency. So we'll still have divided government. And we're not going to have, you know, all Republicans or all Democrats sit down and sing kubaya and everything's going to be fine. No, we're going to have to fight it out as we always have. But we need to have elected officials who are committed to the truth and to the future of the country. And some of them are going to lose the next re-election re as a result of it. That's what happened in 1990. Democrats paid a serious price. And so did George Bush, because he lost the presidency. A lot of people think that's the reason. And Clinton and Democrats paid a big a, a price in 1993 as well. They were courageous. That's supposed to be one of the reasons we elect people. Some people lose office when we impose this solution on the country. And it will have long-term impacts on the Republican Party because of the foolish position they've adopted about no new taxes. Bill, what do you think? The, uh, in 
We heard Ron say kind of shame on the president and, and shame on the other political actors in Washington for not embracing Bowles Simpson. But I mean, there would be an argument that from both sides, to hell with Bowles Simpson. I'm a Democrat, and I don't want to cut entitlements. I think this is, that's why government's in business. You're a Republican, to hell with Bowles Simpson. I'm opposed to tax increases. What do you not get about that? I'm not going to embrace Bowles Simpson. Well, I think that we have to remember also, though, that Bull Simpson had on it elected members from both houses of Congress and both parties. And a majority it, of that commission uh, did vote both to reduce spending, reform entitlements, and raise revenues uh, in the context of tax reform. So we know that elected officials, so it, it is a kind of an Andrews Air Force Base, Bowles Simpson. Right. And uh, for some reason, uh, the way the statute was written, that, uh, or the, the uh, arrangements that set up the commission, uh, it was required that they come up with this supermajority vote and instead of just a simple majority. So I would say it's possible. Um, to find agreement amongst a group of uh, elected officials, including some independent experts. And so an Andrews Air Force Base sh uh, type arrangement shows that people can uh, do know what to do, uh, can find some compromise. But I believe that uh, there are two problems. One uh, Ron already alluded to, and that is the public is in denial. If you look at the public opinion polling, the public is overwhelmingly against any kind of tax increase, except for those at the top. They're, a majority of the public, actually quite a large majority, is in favor of increasing taxes on the wealthy. Um, and by the way, there's a way to do that uh, that doesn't increase rates. All it does is reduces the amount of deductions that people at the top get. Uh, so it would actually improve the efficiency as well as the fairness of the tax system. But um, the public doesn't in general like tax increases, but they also don't want their benefits cut. They are overwhelmingly in favor of keeping current Medicare and Social Security benefits like they are. Now there just isn't enough money in the rest of the budget uh, to accomplish the goal here and so that's why I say the public is in denial. Now, what is the most important uh, job of a leader like a president? I think it's to educate the public. It's to lead. Um, educate comes from the Latin uh, root, meaning to lead. We live in a representative democracy, not a popular democracy. And uh, we elect people to then help us get to where we need to go. And so now I'm, I'm getting way off. Uh, into philosophy here and talking too much. But uh, I think that um, uh, the tragedy of the way our political debate is going right now is it's too much about, uh, you know, Romney's tax return or um, uh, somebody's uh, other peccadillos and not enough about educating the public about what we need to do. Bill, this has been a... Uh, uh, a downbeat panel. Um, <laughs> Depends what you're comparing. It to. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, it's all a baseline issue. And uh, Ron hinted on something that I have heard as a as one kind of scenario, which is, um, let's face it, it's, we're not going to have a, a big clarifying election because not, nobody's no, really going to put the the fundamental issues on the table. Probably what we'll get is some version of divided government. And under this uh, scenario of divided government, uh, re it's Republicans in the Senate who come 2013 say, like, look, this issue's got to get resolved. Uh, it won't be the, the, the House Republicans are too radicalized, but the Senate Republicans are going to say, look, time to solve this issue somehow and create the, uh, the sort of political atmosphere where that could happen. Uh, do you buy that, or, do, or can you envision other scenarios where come 2013 uh, there's a, a, a convergence of incentives that uh, uh, force the political system to act in ways that it hasn't to date acted? Uh, all right, so um, on the, all this political, these various political issues, first of all, is it a cynical disagreement or a principled disagreement? I think, like Ron said, it's both. There's elements of both. 
One way that I like to think about that question is, suppose we had a parliamentary democracy instead of this two houses and White House and stuff. I mean, the founding fathers designed the system so that it would be hard to do big things fast, right? And they were extremely successful, especially in this regard, all right? In a parliamentary democracy, one party would be in charge. If there was an issue, they would have to offer a solution to it, and uh, the, it would get implemented, and public might not like it. They might vote that party out. The other party comes in and changes it. Fine, but, but uh, somebody is actually responsible in a parliamentary democracy. Uh, in our system, everybody can pass the buck, uh, and so you get these, I think it encourages <coughs> some proposals that can only be described as mind-boggling. Uh, uh, Gingrich's tax plan, for example, would extend the Bush tax cuts and cut taxes by $900 billion a year as of 2015. I mean, that's you know, $10 trillion over the decade. That's not a tax increase, obviously, that's a tax cut. And so that would just dig the hole even deeper. But he can go out and say that, knowing that that's never going to happen. But if he were elected, he would have to, have to compromise. So I, I, I if, and if you look around the world, parliamentary democracies tend to be in better shape on these long-term fiscal issues than, than, than we are. Uh, it used to be the case that, that the only countries rated AAA were parliamentary democracies. I'm not sure how that, I know S&P downgraded people last week, I'm not sure how that stat holds. But generally, um, I think that that's an issue, the fact that nobody is actually responsible. And therefore, like Bell said, we have to ask somebody to take leadership. Uh, in a parliamentary democracy, again, there is someone who is de facto the leader. And um, uh, uh, so I think that's an issue. Um, the Senate Republicans in 2013, I don't know. I, you know, this is one of those things where you can go back in time and say, well, you know, you did this, yeah, but you did this before me, yeah, but you did this before me, so on. Uh, where I draw that line is the no new taxes pledge. And uh, as that Ron mentioned, something like 80, 90 percent of the Republicans Congress have signed it, right? And this isn't a statement that they hope there are no new taxes. This is a signed, written pledge that, you know, they won't raise tax rates, they won't remove deductions unless the money goes toward toward cutting tax rates. Uh, I don't see how you get around that politically. Um, either they have to en masse violate it, or we're stuck in a political stalemate where the Republicans say we won't raise taxes. And well, why not say, tax reform, which why should we people cut? think is a, a no, good the, idea anyway? The pledge does not allow tax reform unless, as Bill said, any revenues that come from it are used to reduce tax right. rates. None of the new revenue can go to reduce the deficit. Right. So our tax reform is basically a bait and switch strategy. The Republicans have to say something about taxes. They don't want to say, well, many of them do, but when many of them are willing to say it's all, it's all a spending issue, all we need to do is cut spending. But then they, if they say, well, what about taxes? Well, we'd like to reform the tax system, but they, they don't want to raise raise revenues, and the no new taxes pledge a prohibits on this. them like, from uh, doing that. It's not like we're talking about uh, inventing cold fusion or an anti-gravity machine or something like that. Uh, in 1997, uh, Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton uh, cut a deal. When Bill Clinton left office, we were running surpluses. Like, this should be doable, right? Yeah, it absolutely. should be doable, yeah. but it's not as long as the Republican Party is controlled by a group of people for whom the principle of no new revenues uh, is the overriding objective and priority. So the key well, is you're that we get see enlightened, in reasonable, calm Republicans to take control, as, as like Newt Gingrich, <laughs> right? He yeah, is. but but but. <laughs> But Newt is not where he was right. in the 1990s. The point is, I think, that the Republican Party has moved pretty far to the right. But again, I would assert the point about leadership. Uh, I can recall very distinctly, uh, after Republicans closed the government twice in 96 and 97, uh, and Clinton was completely whomping Republicans something fierce, and all of these very brave freshmen, another parallel with our current situation, started scratching our heads a little bit and saying, geez, Washington might not be like we thought. So Newt waddles on down to the White House and cuts a deal with the president, brings it back to the Republican caucus in the House and says, this is it. 
This is not the best deal, but it's the best deal we can get. And if you don't take it, get yourself another speaker. Right. And they took it. And we opened the government, and everybody lived happily ever after, and we balanced the budget. That's leadership. That's the kind of thing that we have to have. I think Bell's statement to put this on the door of the Republican Party is just grossly unfair. Democrats are equally intransigent about Social Security and Medicare, especially Medicare. So I just, both parties, a pox on both of them. They're both making mistakes, and the public needs to hold both parties accountable. But I, let me answer your question about, this will take one minute. There is some room for optimism here. I could imagine a situation that will occur after the election where the Bush tax cuts come up and the Democrats say to the Republicans, and the president is with them, and they sit down and look across the table at them and they smile at them nicely and tell them how sweet they are, and then they say, okay, guess what? If you don't pass something that includes new taxes, we're going to make sure it doesn't pass. I'll veto it, and the House and the Senate won't pass it. And then they need to sit there for an hour or a day or a month or whatever it takes, including closing the government, and explain to the public, we got to do this, we got to solve this problem, we're willing to give on our side. So, I mean, something like that could happen. It's imaginable. Uh, I'm going to go to questions uh, in just a second, but I want to ask one question before we do. And I think, Ron, this was his best to you, and you guys weigh in if you want to. When we're talking about the, the kind of ideal solution that, uh, 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 that, that you've, you envision, is this a, just a smaller, tighter, more economical federal government with people paying more for it? Uh, or are we going to sort of fundamentally restructure government in the process of doing this and in, and in important ways rewrite the basic uh, compact uh, uh, between citizenry and government that now exists? Right. So, do you understand the question? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, I'm a Republican. Uh, and I actually got Alice Rivlin. She and I wrote a paper in one of our book, Brookings volumes way back, you know, six, seven years ago when we were warning the country this is a big problem. And we cut the hell out of government. We cut education. We cut all kinds of stuff. So you could do that. Unfortunately, even if you did that and did it more than you probably could pass through the Congress, it still would not solve the long-term deficit problem. The only solution to the long-term deficit pro problem is more taxes and less health care. Those two have to be a part of it, and there's no way around it. So we're not really going to cut government, but we're going to control its growth, and we're going to get government out of some of the things it's doing now that it shouldn't be doing. And we'll have a big argument about that, but, but I don't think we're going to have a smaller government. This is an interesting question, and it relates back to the 97 thing you mentioned, as well as the 2010 Bush tax cuts. The 97 agreement was tiny, uh, and it was in a robust economy that was headed north, and it basically, they took money out of expected future surpluses and ended up uh, essentially giving tax cuts back to people. So it was an agreement, but it was not like either 90 or 93, Three. Yep. which were agreements that actually reduced spending. Uh, the, the, what we have to do now is much bigger than that. It's in an economy that's much worse. It's in a political atmosphere that's much more tainted and it's with the baby boomers actually retiring rather than being 15 years away from the baby boomers actually retiring. So uh, uh, let's put it this way. Other than that, things are looking pretty good. If 97 <laughs> is the best we can muster, we aren't going to, that's, that's not going to be anywhere near enough uh, uh, for now. On the 2010 tax cuts, um, every economist had this clever idea all through the decade that the expiration of the 2010 tax cuts would force Congress to really think about fundamental tax reform, and it would be a forcing point, and they would really, at the end of 2010, they would, um, uh, they would have done all this work, and they would come up with a fundamentally new system. Instead, basically nothing happened until about August of that year, and then they just had the debate about whether extending it for 95% of the population or for 100% of the population. Uh, Ron's scenario about Obama saying, we're not going to let these Bush tax cuts be extended, unless you do X, Y, Z, I think is totally unrealistic because Obama went on record in 2008 uh, in the campaign as favoring extension of 95% of them. So, so uh, I thought that was a mistake then. Uh, I continue to think it's a mistake, but, but, but that's where he is. So he'd be totally not uh, a believable threat uh, for him to do that. Can I say something about health care? I know you want to go to the audience, but 
Yeah. Um, I mean, Ron is exactly right, and he says it so succinctly when he says uh, we need to do two things fundamentally, raise revenues and cut health care spending. Uh, on the health care issue, uh, I would argue that uh, on Medicare reform, it is true that there are many Democrats, uh, and particularly the liberal wing of the paper, uh, of the party, who are very much opposed to that, to any tampering with Medicare as we know it. But there are other Republicans, excuse me, I'm getting really, <laughs> there are other Democrats who have actually been open to uh, su fundamental Medicare reform. Uh, the president has been kind of back and forth on this. He has not been good just recently, as Ron suggested. But last summer, he showed some willingness, and so have many other uh, moderate Democrats, to doing the fundamental reforms of Medicare that are needed. But it's understandable to me why the Democratic Party isn't going to uh, make major concessions on Medicare if Republicans remain in concrete on revenues. Right. I mean, that's basically what Obama has right. apparently concluded. Like, right, like, why be reasonable? They're not. I'm right. not going to either. Exactly. All right. We've got an uh, audience. Uh, I think that gentleman over there has had the hand up the longest, but uh, let's, we'll get a bunch of these. Uh, uh, in particular, people would be succinct with their question and ideally direct it to one of the panel members uh, rather than open-ended questions. And uh, Bella's asked also, and I think it's a good idea, if you could just tell us who you are. Uh, Don Mathis, Community Action Partnership. My question's for Bell. Uh, you raised the notion of the income disparity in the beginning. We've talked about shared serious sacrifice. How do those two problems jive in a solution? How do we address the wealth income disparity while looking at the, uh, the need to cut and really significantly reduce expenses? Uh, Bill Gale gave one answer to that, which is if all of the sacrifice is on the spending side of the equation, then almost by definition, uh, it's not going to be shared sacrifice because there's no way to get to people at the top where all of the you know, income has been concentrating recently unless you raise revenues and specifically raise revenues on them. And um, the Republican candidates uh, are not only not asking for any increase in taxes on that group. They are proposing big revenue decreases, tax cuts, for these wealthy individuals in the form of dividends, capital gains, and state taxes, and some other stuff. So um, obviously, the first thing you need to do is not make matters worse. I think the other thing you need to do is not put the whole burden on what we call uh, you know, domestic discretionary programs in the budget, which is where all of the action has been so far. When we um, had the deal in raising the debt ceiling last summer and agreed to cut uh, roughly a trillion dollars, uh, that most of that is in uh, this small slice of the budget where programs for low-income families tend to be concentrated and where education and infrastructure and other things that could help us grow more rapidly in the future are concentrated. So it's, you know, if, if you have as a priority or as a principle that we need more shared sacrifice, uh, there are ways to get things under control uh, in terms of the deficit, but in a way that's much fairer than what we're talking about right now. Where are we at? Uh, yes, sir. And then we'll go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm Basil Scarless. I've recently been involved uh, with the State Department dealing with international economic issues. And, and uh, what surprises me always is the, the uh, Medicare reform debate is always so politicized. Is there any hope that there'll be improved political prospects for reducing Medicare costs through some introduction of some sort of reform that is closer to what Canada or Northern Europe has. <laughs> Who wants to take a I, crack? Okay, at it? Um, we just did an event here uh, a couple of weeks ago on premium support, and I do think that this is going to be part of the answer. I was distressed to see this morning that the CBO has now released a report that the various top-down reforms that 
were part of Obamacare have not yet had an impact on spending. Now, all of them have not been implemented. They haven't been fully tried, but the top-down reforms are not doing too well. So we need something quite different, and premium support is a possibility. Now, the thing about premium support... Can you give the support, shorthand description of okay, that? Okay, yeah, I'm going to do it right now. So the basic idea is that you control spending by giving people an amount of money, and they buy their own health care. Now, this would require exchanges, something Republicans have not... Uh, seem to realize yet, but there has to be a market. You create a market. Medicare could be part of the market, but you have a capped amount of money that people get. They go in the market, they buy whatever they want to, but that's the amount of money they get. And then the crucial issue, how much does it increase each year? Because in the past, health care uh, uh, costs have increased way more than inflation. And the first Ryan plan on premium support would have would have been totally inadequate to increase at the rate of inflation, I think it was. You need a bigger rate of increase in that. It needs to bear some relationship to what's going on in the market. So Alice Ribble and others would do GDP growth plus 1%. So there are ways to do that. If we had something like premium support, we could actually have a budget and we could control the way that we spend. But now someone's going to have to pick up the difference if it doesn't work and change the market. If the price, the average increase of health care does not come down, then someone's going to have to eat it. And the way you do that and be fair, to go back to Bell's point, is that you have a, a graduated system, means tested, and o people who have more money, they pay the full cost of care or maybe even a little more, and people down at the bottom pay less than the full cost of care because they get a bigger subsidy than the rest of the people. But there, the whole point is you control it because you give a certain amount of money each year rather than an open-ended, go get whatever you want. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm uh, Jonathan Pollack from Brookings. Uh, left unspoken in this discussion, very, very interesting discussion, is the question of national defense expenditure, which includes, of course, I might add, a growing portion of the DOD budget is, in fact, military entitlements. Um, granted that, and if one looks at those portions of the federal budget that are where you have discretionary income, this is clearly a very, very big one. How do any of you, granted there have been agreements, uh, Obama has promised as a consequence of the, of last, of the, of the deal, uh, to reduce defense expenditure by approximately 450 or 500 billion dollars over a 10 year period. But in a lot of ways, that's, just a drop in the bucket. I mean, if we're, we're asking questions about how the United States allocates monies here and for what roles and missions, would anyone want to comment on how that factors into this debate or ought to? Well, I'll just start by saying something that I'm sure you already know, Jonathan, and that, but maybe the others don't, which is that uh, part of the failure of the so-called super committee is that we're now supposed to have a sequester that will fall very heavily on uh, defense spending uh, starting in 2013. So the big $64 question uh, all through this year is going to be whether or not Congress un undoes, undoes, <laughs> um, gets rid of this sequester because uh, Republicans in particular, but some Democrats as well, uh, really, really are worried about such deep cuts in defense spending. I would say that is, again, just a manifestation of the fact that as long as the conversation is about cut spending, keep it to 20% of GDP, have a balanced budget amendment, you know, those kinds of rhetorical, you know, I'm a deficit hawk and uh, we can cut spending, but never get specific and never say what they're going to cut. Uh, you have a huge problem. Now, the, the thing about the sequester is it is quite specific with respect to defense. And suddenly, Republicans, and Ron talked about this earlier, say, oh, well, we didn't mean we wanted to cut that. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, again it, it comes up in the context of shared sacrifice and uh, a bigger debate about what role we want to play in the world. Let me make two quick points. First of all, what we've already achieved we haven't even mentioned this, it, it, it's not inconsiderable. A $900 billion that's already being put in place and $1.2 in the sequester. 
That's over $2 trillion. It doesn't quite reach the ma magnitude you're talking about. We've got to do a lot more. But that is not a bad down payment. Right. So but we've got to keep it. Really we've got to keep it. And now the big problem is defense because everybody is suddenly looking. And I can see that. I've seen this happen in this town before. Lots and lots of pressure, even from some cases, surprising places, Panetta, saying this is too much. Uh, we can't, you know, we're going to be in danger and so forth. So which is fine, the president says he will veto anything that doesn't reach the $1.2 trillion. I hope he actually does it, because then Republicans are going to be faced with the issue of, okay, if we're really not going to do any revenues, where else are we going to cut? Because we've got to make up for whatever we're going to save in defense. And for Democrats, they've got to say, okay, we have to, if, if they're... Some of them definitely are going along with the well, defense Give us issue. a sense of the timing. When was that going to happen? If the Well, the cuts the start thing. in 2013, so the, the president would have to be vigilant all year long. You have to make sure that when, uh, you know, when October 1 comes, that those are in place or something equivalent. Equivalent's fine. As long as the Congress, I mean, I think the president should clarify that, and he should start taking this to American people right now. But are so we that, facing a sort of a pivot point date of any kind where you'll find out whether Obama's serious about the veto or not? It doesn't happen between now and 1 October. It will go in place. Now, you really won't know how it's going to happen until you see the actual appropriation bills for 2013. That's where you'll really see what's actually going to happen, even though it is specified a lot. In the agreement, as Bell says, there's still flexibility in there, and there, what defense accounts get cut and all that kind of thing. And on that point, wait, hold it. Go ahead. Very quickly. <laughs> there are two things in defense that we really should do something about. Ironically, one of them is health, because yeah. people, the defense, they pay almost the whole thing, and you know, people who get health care have to pay a significant part of it. We've learned that, and they don't in defense, so they got to do something about that. I realize they're counter arguments. And also, retirement is a complete outrage. We're in this situation, we live in a democracy, we don't have thousands and millions of young kids who want to go over to Afghanistan and have somebody shoot at them. So we have to have a defense that attracts people, and one of the biggest attractions is retirement, but it's an outrage. So I was in the Marine Corps, if I had stayed in longer, I could get out when I was 38 years old, and they would give me retirement for the rest of my life. We can't have that. we got to change that, and that's part of how we're going to be able to absorb some of these blows in the defense budget if we can get realistic about things like that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for this panel. Um, my question ultimately will be to Ron Haskins. Um, I'm Rochelle Friedman with the Coalition on Human Needs, and I'm very concerned about some of the rhetoric that has started, like uh, Romney talking about um, opportunity versus welfare society, Gingrich talking about the president as the SNAP president, the food stamp president. Food stamps is a program that's wonderful. It's working as it should, counter-cyclically. We see a lot of low-income programs. They're discretionary, so not everyone who gets them, uh, who's eligible gets them. With LIHEAP, it's 20%. And now that program has been cut by 20%. Um, you're, the program that you had a lot to do with, Mr. Haskins, TANF, that block grant has not been increased. It's still at $16 billion, which, it, which is what it was in 1996. So I'm very, very concerned about what's happening with the lower end of our population. And unfortunately, as Bell has pointed out, we've started to do those discretionary cuts. And I just wonder how you, because again, I'm asking you, I guess, to start because you've had a history of working on these things like TANF. Um, you know, a much smaller percentage of people eligible for TANF now receive it. Um, do you share my concern, first of all, about the rhetoric that's starting to bubble up that's very, um, uh, anti, I would say, people that through no fault of their own are in poverty. Uh, rhetoric on a 10-point scale uh, works me up at about two. Uh, Republicans always talk like that. Uh, the, uh, Romney says, for example, he's going to have a Medicare block grant and it's going to save $700 billion over 10 years. Medicaid. Huh? You said Medicare. You meant Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid. I'm sorry. Medicaid. Uh, not going to happen. The governors won't let it happen. Even Republican governors won't let it happen. So I would pay less attention to the rhetoric than what Congress has actually done so far. 
There was protection and across the board cuts for almost all of the low income programs. We had the same kind of protections in Graham Road and Hollings. So I think, I mean, you're right to be concerned, but I think so far, I certainly wouldn't be despondent. I think we will, in the, fine, in the end, we will have a solution that will cut some low income programs, but it will disproportionately cut programs for other people, I think, and increase revenues, which will take pressure off low-income programs. You're right to be concerned, but I don't think it's going to be a disaster. Bill, can I ask you, the, the reference to governors uh, prompted a question that uh, it was on my list in any event. Are there, uh, given how sort of downbeat we are about uh, the uh, uh, rational workings of Washington, are there examples at the state level, governors and state legislatures, who really offer a model for solving, for Washington solving its structural problems? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, the the states, by and large, are not in great fiscal condition, uh, and of course, one way to solve quote unquote quote solve unquote the federal budget problem is by divesting responsibilities onto the states. I think everyone realizes that that's not a real solution, uh, but there are some possibilities uh, for. Um, uh, there are some ways that the state situation can make the federal situation uh, worse. One is the state, uh, the two issues mainly facing the states are pensions and health care. And uh, uh, with pen in both cases, they've made commitments that uh, are not sustainable. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, I think, whether the federal government uh, has any role to play in those. Uh, you could see a, a reallocation of Medicaid, like. Ron was talking about, it seems less likely that there'd be a reallocation of pension responsibilities. But those are the two big moving parts at the state level. And uh, uh, neither is good news for the federal government. Yes, sir. My name is Joe Belschling, and this question is directed for Mr. Gale. You mentioned briefly that we need to reform more than just the income tax. Uh, what are your opinions on other taxes such as the capital gains or the AMT alternative minimum tax and things like that, and what other areas can we pursue with the tax system? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, what I would like to see in the tax, in the income tax, which includes capital gains and AMT and dividends and other stuff, is a broad base uh, uh, where that is reducing, curtailing ex uh, tax expenditures, you know, itemized deductions, exclusions, et cetera. Uh, using some of the revenue to flatten, to reduce uh, the rate structure and using most of the revenues for deficit reduction. Uh, if there are various exchanges that could be made, for example, if you got rid of the AMT or moved the features of the AMT into the regular tax, uh, uh, then you would, you would probably need a higher rate than if you kept the AMT. Uh, but, but the general direction of income tax reform, I think, is pretty straightforward, broaden the base. Uh, use much of that revenue for deficit reduction, use some of it for rates. Uh, then beyond that, you know, we get these fantastical programs in 999 or, or everyone's got some fancy new tax system. Um, uh, we don't need to go out and create some new tax system that's never been used anywhere in the world. Uh, we have perfectly reasonable functional examples from other countries, including the VAT, the value added tax, which is essentially a national consumption tax, uh, which could raise significant amounts of revenues. Um, and on the energy side, either a carbon tax or if it takes too long to implement that, just jack up the gas tax, uh, which would have all sorts of good uh, environmental qualities uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, revenue qualities. I mean, you're, our gas tax is a tenth of what it is in some European countries, and and uh, if you raise the gas tax a quarter a year for ten years, you know you'd end up with something like two percent of GDP in added revenues. Bill, all these great ideas that Bill has for raising taxes, wouldn't these hit the uh, uh, and for that matter, all all the great ideas that Ron has for cutting spending, wouldn't these hit the brakes pretty hard on a on an economy that's already in trouble? Yes, they shouldn't be done right away, although, as uh, Bill has argued and I and others have argued as well, if you introduced a value-added tax, let's say, in 2013 and phased it in gradually uh, but enacted it so people knew it was coming 
and that the rate only increased slowly as the economy recovered, it would have wonderful effects because it would say to people, if you buy something now, you won't have to pay this national sales tax that we call a VAT, but if you buy it later, you're going to have to pay this tax. So it would help the recovery, it would help the deficit, and it would increase economic growth potentially because it would be on consumption and not on savings. Uh, some people also believe it would uh, in encourage, it would help our trade uh, balance, but that's controversial. I think we've got one back there. We've got two. Let's go a little further back and then come forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Checo, Checo Communications, and I've heard the term uh, shared sacrifice bandied about quite a bit this morning. Um, I hate to say it, but I think it's a lot of hooey. Uh, we don't put a value on it. Uh, I think uh, a great portion of the 99% have already made a great sacrifice, and I don't think the 1% is shared at all. And so when we come to this kind of notion of shared sacrifice for the entire country, it's not an equal sacrifice for all. There are a lot of people who have already lost their homes, lost their health care, lost their jobs, and have sacrificed more than their share. Um, two, I would like to posit an analogy, and that by saying, if you believe, as I believe, that money to the economy is like blood to the body, and when blood doesn't circulate to the entire body, we start having to lop off fingers and toes, which give us our work and our balance. We're seeing a time here in America where we're not getting that distribution of wealth. Forget about redistribution, just distribution of wealth. And over time, if we don't change this paradigm, we're going to end up a basket case. Because when money doesn't circulate to the entire economy, everybody loses, including the wealthy. And America won't be the same country it is today. 10, 15 years from now, if we don't do something. Thank you. Sorry oh, it wasn't a question. Can I say okay. something about that? Please. Um, I agree with the thrust of your statement, and I just want to point out on the uh, your blood circulating through the body uh, metaphor that one of the things that is uh, being discussed here at Brookings more and more now is the fact that if most of the income that we've had uh, in recent years has been going to the wealthy. And if the wealthy save most of their income as opposed to consuming very much of it, you know, they consume a much lower proportion, they can afford to save a lot more, and they do, uh, then that does begin to affect uh, the flow of money in the system because it's not being spent. And if you have the middle class and working class and below all in deep trouble and unable to spend, and you have the top of the income distribution not spending very much because they can afford to not spend very much, you do begin to have a economic problem as a result, or so goes the argument. Um, and look, we wait, saw wait, that wait, in the late the, 1920s, by the, the way, that that happened. I want to point out two things about this question. First of all, the very best evidence, I believe, shows that the entire distribution of income has moved up. The stuff you read in the New York Times and read from Piketty and Saez is based on income tax returns is just not accurate. It's misleading. The entire distribution has moved up. Some of that has flown down, gone down to the bottom. Now, to be sure, m more than in the past has gone to the top. I don't like that either. So what do you want to do, pass a law that limits people's income? I mean, there are issues here about how you actually do it. The, the rich pay a huge percentage of the income tax. We have, one of the most, uh, we have one of the most progressive income taxes in the world. I'd even be willing to increase a little bit more. But, Bell, I'm surprised you didn't bring this up. Our research shows, and we just did it again for 2009, right in the middle of the recession, if you follow three really complicated rules, graduate from high school, Get a job, get married before you have children. Your chances of being in poverty are 2%. If you violate all three rules, it's 70%. America still works. A kid from the bottom 20% that goes to college quadruples the chance of making all the way to the top and cuts by half the chance in the bottom. So the constant message that America is unfair and the 99% went, you know, it not helping anybody. There's a lot that already, and finally, finally, <laughs> government programs. In, 19, in the 1980s, government programs, I'm talking now about a specific group, the group most likely to be poor, unmarried mothers, never married mothers, okay? Their 
life in the state of nature from them, 50% of them are in poverty. After government programs, 40% of them are in poverty. So even then, government programs were having an impact. In, in 2006, after welfare reform and the work rates among those mothers was much higher than it had been in the past, 40% of them are in poverty right at the beginning, and government programs then took it down to 25%. This is the key. Individual effort and wise government programs that support people who work. If we did that, we would get a lot further than we get now. We still have problems with recessions, and this is not foolproof and so forth, but don't leave the personal responsibility part out, and don't leave out the part that government programs are already doing a lot to cure the problem that you're concerned about. We've got a few more questions up, and we've had some people who have been very patient. Uh, we're not going to get everybody, but I would like to come forward quickly and get to you, ma'am, uh, after, uh, uh, after this gentleman. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Andrew Stevenson. I am um, an attorney still looking for work, like many of my cohort. Um, but this is actually sort of following on uh, from the uh, question about uh, taxes, specifically the value-added tax. Um, so what, what I'm wondering is why is there so much opposition from the Republican presidential candidates to a value-added tax? We saw that a lot in the debates, um, especially, con con um, especially considering its uh, superior economic efficiency to the income tax. And on the Democratic side, um, the regressivity issues can be handled completely, and then there is a lot of environmental benefit to reducing consumption and internalizing um, externalities. Um, and then sort of what do you think is an ideal rate for implementing a value-added tax in the United States? Can uh, I just tell the Larry Summers thing and then turn it back to you, Bill? Okay. Uh, you know, I, I've always gotten a kick out of the fact that Larry Summers once asked a question similar to yours, um, said, Republicans don't like a value-added tax because it's a revenue machine, a money machine. Mm. Democrats don't like it because it is regressive. Uh, we will get a value-added tax when Republicans understand it's regressive and Democrats understand it's a money machine. <laughs> yeah, so as to why the Republican candidates don't want a value added tax, I mean, they're, they're looking at tax cuts, not tax increases. It's just not even on their agenda to talk about uh, legislative increases in revenues. Uh, in terms of the rate, um, it, it Rates around the world vary from the 10 to 25 percent. Part of it depends on how much revenue you want to raise. Part of it depends on how much you're willing to include in the VAT. Uh, I would like to see an extremely broad base in the VAT with very few, if any, exemptions. I would like to compensate for the regressivity of it with, with uh, either what are called demigrants or uh, grants, credits to the tax system. But if you did that, um, you could exempt, uh, say you had a 10% value added tax, you could, you could exempt all consumption up to the poverty line uh, from the tax and still raise, you know, 3 4% of GDP in revenue. And that, that, that's a lot of money. It could be phased in. I'm not so worried about, I, wa I want to echo something Bell said earlier about that it's not so important that we, that we install all of these taxes completely now. It makes a much bigger difference that what, what the system looks like five years from now or ten, 10 years from now. So if you want to phase in a carbon tax or phase in a VAT or phase in a gas tax, I'm fine with that. That, that, that works fine. It, it, it's, um, it's the ultimate structure of the system that, that will make the difference. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, and Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I'd like to bring in a few points that I haven't heard we talk about, that we're not in a closed domestic market now we've been dealing with uh, global markets. And for the last 10 years, with the WTO and we exchange, it seems like a lot of our deficit has to do with the international problems, including two wars, and also the um, losing of markets, international markets, because of the problems of currency differences, and also the fact that we're losing a lot of jobs. I think millions of jobs, it was like seven millions of jobs being lost outside to China and India and third world countries because of low labor costs out there. So I think we are addressing maybe not the exact problems. I've seen that for the last two years, President Obama has stopped two wars, 
we brought home many troops. We cut costs in that. Um, if you can give me a cost of one day in the war, is up to 100 million or so, one day spending. So I think we cut costs there. We brought troops home, so we cut costs there. And I would like to uh, hear more about our extending market to Asia Pacific. I think the recent FTAs and the TPPs expecting to bring in, in a lot of jobs and market. And more importantly, we bring jobs here to the US. So I'd like to hear more of that. The second point I'd like to talk about is the baby boomers. Um, the Social Security and the Medicare, Medicaid, that the country will have to um, give you as entitlement. And would the, the well-to-do, the rich people in the countries, I'm not sure they're only 1%, but the baby boomers, now not working anymore and not paying into the revenue, but getting Social Security. Is there any solution to that? Right. That's a lot there. There's a lot smart there <laughs> and, and a lot. The last, so we're the gonna last have to point. Just no, last no, point. no, no, no. Two is enough. <laughs> this is very important very point. This is very important point. All the candidates for president from the GOP, I only heard one thing they want to do. They want to take down Obama. I didn't hear them want to do anything good for the people. So was there yeah. a question of racism in there? Thank you. So, All right. There's too much there to just to easily parse. But I'm going to take that question because it is so open and it has a lot of genuinely serious ideas. We are almost out of time, and I'm going to, we're going to, here's how we're going to wrap this up. If you could, we could address some of the questions, the issues and her questions. And I also would observe that what a lot of what I've heard today is uh, the candidates in both sides are evading the issues, not being honest with the voters. The voters, what's more, are, are co-conspirators in this because they don't really want honest debate. With respect, you guys are a drag. Uh, you are really, uh, this is really a pessimistic panel, and I want to finish this up answering her questions and also answering mine, which is give me one reason to be optimistic, and we'll, uh, we'll just go right down. Go ahead, okay. Bill. And, uh, she had three. You can talk at whatever string okay, you want. Okay, so the globalization issue is important, and it's, and it's linked to the income distribution issue that we've talked about. When we say we're, that there are wage competition, uh, that's, that's affecting the, 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 com the, com the compensation levels in the, in the U.S. So, uh, yeah, those are first order issues. Uh, the other place where it weighs in heavily with respect to the budget issue is on capital taxation and corporate taxation in particular. And I, I fully agree those things should be included. Um, uh, for Social Security and Medicare, yes, there are solutions. Social Security, there are very well defined uh, the solutions, there's a whole range. Medicare, uh, um, we can solve it on paper. Like Ron said, we can have a premium support system where we just don't raise the amount. That doesn't really solve the bigger problem, which is how does a society provide health care, but it, it, because, because individuals are the residual uh, risk absorbers in that, in that world, and, and there would be added costs and CBO has done a report on that, that we can talk about. But Medicare, I think we're going to get to the solution in stages. We're going, to, we're going to do something, learn about it, do something, learn about it, do something, learn about it. Whereas Social Security, we could fix it right, right now. One reason to be optimistic is that if you look over the, the broad history of the country, whether it's uh, civil rights or uh, I don't know, women's suffrage issues or the Civil War. Uh, you know, there's this famous Winston Churchill quote about you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't know, you know, we have a very vibrant uh, economy. We, you know, say what you want about the Republican debates and the the quality of the discussion. There is a lot of discussion. There's a lot of ideas being thrown around. Um, uh, you know, maybe it, man, many of them are delusional, but but this is how stuff gets started. And I think as a country, uh, I mentioned our political system tries to slow things down, but somehow um, historically we've been we've been able to overcome that. Good. I think you're too late to make a profound point about wars. Uh, we're getting out of both wars and. Uh, Obama set deadlines. I think he showed with the rock. He's pretty serious. His base is certainly insisting on it, and he appears to be doing it. And in any case, we are going to really play havoc on the defense budget. We've talked about that up here already. 
it's good. defense is, is on the defensive, there's no question about it. Secondly, I think the comment about Republicans is uncalled for. Uh, in fact, it's part of rhetoric. Uh, Republicans have laid a lot of good ideas on the table. Ryan's budget very nicely clarifies things. It had the first good example of premium support, and not the first, but the first that a major politician had put out, and it's led to lots of interesting discussions, so I reject the point about Republicans. The reason to be optimistic is A, we live in a democracy, and B, we have the world's most creative and productive economy. Yeah, you're uh, going to get the last word on this panel. I, We're just a couple minutes over. Which is she nice. always plans I, I it that way. I'm going to try to both answer your question and her question, or one of her questions, uh, which is I think both parties are interested in investing in two things, education and infrastructure. I think they both support those two goals. Now, we haven't gotten to where we need to be in terms of the specifics, but I think that there's room for common ground there and there has been bipartisan support for education reform in the past, for infrastructure investments. I think we can get there again. There are these ideas about an infrastructure bank, which make a lot of sense to me, that would involve the private sector. Uh, so, you know, we could have a longer conversation about that. Second reason I'm optimistic is because all of you are here today. It shows you're interested, you're informed, uh, you're participating in the public debate. And uh, we appreciate that, and we will continue to try to get these issues on the table through the campaign 2012 uh, effort, and I'm sure you'll all want to read Politico as well. <laughs> all right. Bell, thank you very much. It looks like uh, uh, Ben has snuck out, uh, but I wanted to thank him again. Uh, this was a great session. You guys have another 11 of these, I guess. By that time, you're going to have all the problems licked. So that's a reason <laughs> enough to be optimistic. Thank you.